Good afternoon. This is the CDG Podcast, aka Creative Design Group. My name is Elder Zavala. And I'm Christian Gonzalez. I'm the co owner of Creativity Design Group. And I am the marketing manager of Creative Design Group. Proud marketer. Thank you for joining us today, Elder. Today we are going to talk about Tillman Fertitta's new book, Shut Up and Listen. Shut Up and Listen. It, it doesn't mm. get any more straightforward than that, right? 100%. Uh, and it, you know, it, it might come off as impulsive, but when you're a billionaire, you can be impulsive, I promise you. It's important to be able to make uh, decisions right off the back like that. It even says so in the book. Mm-hmm. To be a good leaders may, are able to make decisions right off the back without even thinking, especially when times are tough. Yeah, I, and being blunt, being blunt is, to me, being blunt is a, a business attribute that many entrepreneurs should have, but a lot don't. I mean, I can say I can honestly uh, attest to that because I'm a very blunt person. I tell everything like it is. I don't believe in sugar coating, and I believe in being honest. So just remember that if you ever ask me a question, I'm just going to be honest with you. So please don't ever get offended whenever I say something back to you if you ask me a question. See, funny thing is, me, I respect that. I think that uh, we can't have a clear conversation unless somebody is just a very good talker or they're blunt. But, uh, hey, man, that should make up for an interesting podcast. You know, uh, us, that's all we're going to get into this book and, and, you know, free flow for the first episode and uh, see, you know, let, let, these, let, let the book just flow. Because uh, it was a good book, man. Man, I read the whole book and then I read the beginning, you know, the, the half of it, I'm like twice because it's so informational. Plus, I'm not reading it. I'm doing it through uh, the audio thing. So while I'm at work, I play that in the audio and, you know, I, I like to listen to it quite often, you know. And this book, this book is actually a book that every entrepreneur needs to read. It doesn't matter if you're just starting out or mm-hmm. if you've been in business for many years. Right. It, it's an important book, and especially if you're just starting out, you have to read this book. It tells you exactly what you need to do, how to start your business, and how you should treat your customers. It's it's basically a, a, a startup manual. I learned more mm-hmm. from this book than anything that I learned when I was in school. And uh, I would like to start off our discussion of the book Elder, by asking you first, uh, what really stood out to you mainly in the book? When you've uh, you've already read it from cover to cover, but what were the main points that that stood out to you the most? And what if you had to share this book with any of your friends who were starting businesses? Which chapters and areas would you have them put their main focus on when they read the book? Uh, well, I think what I got from the book mostly is <clears throat> throughout the book, Tim and Fatida kept saying that you know he doesn't think he's any smarter than uh, the the regular the average person you know uh, the electrical engineer the you know the guy who the guy who is a mechanic for the body uh, at a body shop for you know just uh, fixes cars you know so I think the the cool thing about this is a billionaire as himself saying that he's not the smartest guy in the room it, it, it can open your mind up because uh, automatically somebody with the most money you know you know uh, a real surface level person might say oh okay uh, he's definitely the smartest guy in here I'm gonna try to be to have you know a uh, smart conversation with him so I got that I like that about it is you know you don't need to be the smartest person to be uh, good in business you just need to be very loud do your do your numbers, do your due diligence, uh, have your marketing, and you know you'll be all right. You know, you just really need to know your business. So, I got that from the book, and I oh, uh, if I was to if I was to to recommend this book to uh, any of my friends or associates, it would depend on what what market they're in, what industry they're in. Like, I have a a friend who owns a uh, a restaurant. <laughs> and this book perfectly aligns with the restaurant industry. You know, he has a lot of metaphors to, to you know, and examples that stem from his uh, franchises of uh, restaurants that he owns. So I would tell him to pay attention to that. But honestly, to just pay attention to, he's going to tell you exactly what you need to know if you really want to run a successful business, you know. And it can it can result in a change of behavior. Not 
result, but he, he's insinuating a change of behavior if your behavior is a certain kind of way. Uh, you know, you have to be militant in, in the business. And I would tell people to just uh, whatever you understand what your weaknesses are. And if you hear your weaknesses in this book, then, you know, listen to it. Or if you hear something that you really don't understand, listen to because he really went into deep uh, detail, you know. And, of course, you have Google as well. So, you know, when you hear about something, you can always use Google to uh, to research anything. You know what I mean? So, uh, what topic about the book did you want to talk about first, CG? Well, I have I have several topics. I call I, sorry, Chris. I uh, call Christian CG. So when he says CG, that's just my nickname for Christian. And uh, just briefly, uh, we should also introduce our our audience to Mr. Fertitta as well, because there aren't there probably aren't many people out there who are aware of, of what he does and what type of businesses he runs. But just to give a quick rundown, those of you who have heard brand names such as Landry's, Morton Steakhouse, Joe's Crab Shack, just to name a few, these are all part of a multi-million dollar conglomerate that he privately owns called Landry's Inc. And those I think people, it's multi-billion dollar. It, it, it's a multi-billion dollar company. Mm. And on top of that, those of you who live here in H-Town, he is also the owner of the Houston Rockets. Many of you probably didn't know that as well. Clay City, baby. Clay City, we going all the way this year. Now, the, the first topic that I want to discuss in would be the importance of hospitality in business. When it comes to when it comes to hospitality, you have to be able to treat all of your customers like they're kings and queens. It doesn't matter how rude they are. It doesn't matter how nasty they are. You have to be able to treat them like your only client or customer that you have. And um, I would like to discuss uh, a few examples of hospitality and what my company CDG has done to address such a problem. Uh, we have a major client out in League City. They are Stone Cold Meats, and they own several specialty meats. They they produce several meat products that you won't find anywhere else. If you go to Kroger, H-E-B, you will not find these high-end products. You have to go to League City to find them. Mm-hmm. And they hold they host several events every year. We were even a guest at their parking lot party uh, this past July. Mm-hmm. And... I learned so much about hospitality from how they treat their customers, and then I knew that eventually there would come a time where no matter how smooth things were running, they may run into a problem with our product or service. That's unavoidable in business, regardless of how well you you are with them and what a great relationship you have. Absolutely. And Stone Cold Meats, uh, they placed an order for a thousand business cards uh, back in September. Mm. UPS messed up and they delivered the cards on a day when they were closed and somebody else, somebody that they didn't even know, signed off for the cards and the order went missing. This put them in a major bind because they had an event coming up and they needed business cards. So what did I do to address this problem? Well, Mr. Fertitta says to be able to offer an alternative whenever a product that a customer wants is not available. So what I did was, I went ahead and I ordered them some more business cards. I did not charge them for it. I paid for them out of my own pocket and I drove all the way to Leap City to deliver them uh, on a personal level. Additionally, it's all about remedying a situation whenever it's messed up, whenever you need to be able to uh, step in and fix a problem when they're in a crisis. Can you talk about can you talk about the inconvenience that they had on you, but this and how significant the inconvenience was it was the inconvenience of you unimportant because you were accompanying a, a customer? This inconvenience to me was very important to me. Uh, I didn't I didn't shove this under the bus as most people would say. Mm-hmm. No, what I'm saying, when I say inconvenience, I'm saying the inconvenience of you to drive all the way to League City. And do you feel like that that, that was a, a hindrance or you didn't even think twice about it? I didn't think twice about it. It's part of my job. And part of my job is making sure that the clients are happy no matter what it takes. And they were very happy that I was able to do this for them. Because... Uh, Sometimes you'll run into situations that are beyond your control. We, right. we were able to produce the cards, but UPS messed up on their part by delivering to a different business, possibly. We, they still don't know to this day who signed off on that order when it got delivered, but they delivered on a day when they were closed, and some stranger signed off on it, and we, we don't know who it was. Oh, that's what happened. Wow. 
That's unfortunate. So uh, I was able to go ahead and make up for it by ordering them some cards. Mr. Fertitta says in his book that whenever your customers are not happy, offer an alternative solution that'll alleviate that problem. That'll be able to make it better for you. Yeah, you always want to keep a customer with a good taste in their mouth about your company. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. uh, Because, you know, some people nowadays, uh, people as, as customers, they're, you know, People have evolved, you know, as as the world has went on and as the social media and Internet has evolved into what's, what it is now, uh, people have become more savvy as customers and they and people are always like good service. You know, people understand energy of a company. You know, you can see I can put like on a smaller scale. Uh, I have an example. My girlfriend, she went to go get her hair braided by somebody who you know it was an exchange so the like, the girl had a, a business you know that was her business of doing hair and uh, while she was there she took I mean probably over three four five hours she was on the phone with her friends and things like that while she was you know doing what she was supposed to do and she didn't have all the product that she needed so it took longer than you know than, than it should basically right and things like that even on that small of a scale your customer is seeing what's going on and they don't, they, you know, they they see that, okay, I'm not that important to you, so my money isn't that important to you, but they just see that I'm not that important to you and there's a likely chance that they wouldn't come back, you know, somebody, people want to feel like they, they're being accompanied on, on the best level, that you will do anything to make sure that they're happy, you know right. what I mean? And that doesn't mean you have to break your back to to a company because most customers they know what your service is and they just want to come for that service and they want you to bring the most hospitable service you can you know what I mean they're not looking for you know they're not going to go to a restaurant and say hey do y'all uh, do y'all have candy for sale no they're not going nobody's going to a restaurant and saying hey can I get some Starburst that doesn't mean they know what they're there for it just is up to uh, the business and the company to run as it should and to accompany their customers uh, as they should and keep a smile on their face you know what I mean yeah I think that that is very very important and I'm glad you brought that topic up because uh, I think that that plays a part in when uh, there's a phrase in the book that Tim and Fatida talks about at the very beginning. He says, "There's a paddles for everybody's ass." <laughs> and I, that's a you know in Houston, you just know, man. That's so southern. That's a you know those <laughs> those southern uh, those southern uh, little you know what do you call that? Those those southern. Uh, uh, it's a dialect. Yeah, it's like a dialect, but they have, we just have sayings in the South. Right. And it, I mean, they'll tell you how to how to run your life. They'll tell you it's the manual to your life sometimes with some of these uh, quotes that people have. But uh, yeah, I think it's important when you say, when you say there's a paddle for everybody ass, you need to make sure that you're always uh, on your toes and you need to be ready for the worst possible outcome that could happen in the company or even something that the company can't control because there's I mean you have this is a small company compared to this big world you can't run away from the problems that happen whether the stock market crashes you know the Great Depression you know uh, a natural disaster anything can happen and you have to be ready or else you're gonna sink like the Titanic you know what I mean right I mean a paddle for everybody ass let me break it down so he says a paddle for everybody ass that means anything could happen in the business whether you control it or not it can go from you not having enough enough money to keep your inventory going and and people just putting their orders and you don't have any money to accompany that or whether it's you have investors and you didn't think about your numbers good enough but you talk so good so 
well and you had such a good presentation that you were able to raise capital from investors, but you're not a lot, you're not able to execute the way you needed to because you weren't prepared to the, you know, to the utmost of your ability. You know what I mean? Or it can be something out of your control, like we just said. It can be a stock market crash and, you know, you weren't prepared for that. You weren't, you didn't have enough uh, operating capital, working capital, and, and money to uphold your company. You didn't have enough brand to stay in the business to where somebody would think about you. You know what I mean? So a part of everybody is it's just basically saying that we need to always uh, be ready for anything. That that statement, ready for anything, is 100% valid in business, don't you think? It is. And that that paddle, said metaphorical paddle, can come in so many different forms. As you, and you gave several great examples. And in fact, I would like to share a story where I had to be the paddle for a certain nameless chicken restaurant's ass, I should say. <laughs> now, many of us, many of us are aware that a certain chicken chain uh, went viral overnight over their over their popular chicken sandwich. Oh, I wonder who that is. Right. We. Let's just say let's just say that uh, I I had a pretty negative experience, but I did not take this experience lying down. Did they feed you spinach? <laughs> no, they. But I, they, if they did feed me spinach, they should be they should be scared. I'd probably turn into Popeye right on the spot. Oh, <laughs> oh there it is. There it goes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So what happened, CG? Well, what happened was it was a couple of weeks ago, and I went to the nearest location to my house to their nearest restaurant mm -hmm. and I wanted to get myself one of their delicious chicken sandwiches and a side of red beans and rice now that might sound a little bit detailed but I'll tell you why that's important in just a second I went through the drive through and when I went through I looked at their menu board and they had a big sticker over the chicken sandwich that said they were sold out and keep in mind this is after the date that they had brought them back after being off the menu for a, a while mm -hmm. now this is, I, oh you said this is after they brought them back this is after they brought him back. I can't believe you went to get the chicken sandwich, but go ahead, per proceed. So, this, I just need to say that this is not the negative part of the story, but the, neg the negative part is coming, and I have a lot to share about this experience. So, okay. uh, I decide to order something else. I decide I'm gonna order uh, two, two chicken wraps and a large red beans and rice. So I go up to the speaker, and I place the order, and I, ta I ask about the sandwiches, and she tells me, come back at, after one today. Uh, I was there at around 11 a.m. I, I wanted to beat the lunch crowd. Mm -hmm. But, okay, I decide uh, I'm probably not going to be coming back because I have other things to do. You said you were there at what time again? 11 a.m. 11 a.m. She said to come back at 1 o'clock. After 1. Okay, after 1. Just keep in context, okay? So uh, I go ahead and I place my order, and then I pull up to the window. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady takes my credit card. I believe she's a manager, and this is going to be important to know later as well because uh, the juicier part of the story, no pun intended, is coming. Okay. So she takes my credit card, okay, and I'm sitting there waiting a while, and I'm looking through the window as they're as they're preparing my order, and I don't see them preparing my order. I see them messing around with the cash register. It looked like maybe they were out of receipt tape or something, but and then I see them pulling the the cash register drawer out, and it just looks. I can tell from where I'm sitting, everything's in disarray. Mm -hmm. So. She opens the window and gives me my credit card back without a receipt, and she goes, uh, we don't have the Tinder wraps. They're not in the computer right now. So that alone is a mess up right there. They, so they so they charged you for for what you for what you wanted, but they said they're not going they're not even ready yet. They didn't charge me, and that's what and that's what uh, I want to talk about next. Okay. She tells me, I'll give you some chicken tenders. Uh, you don't have to pay for them. So she hands me uh, a box of chicken tenders and fries, and I, you know I'm cool. With that I, I thought it was nice of them to uh, to do that. Oh yeah, it's free. But the thing is that 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 sense of happiness, that sense of being treated uh, like a king, uh, metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. faded away very quickly. I get home. This guy, uh, let, let me stop right there. This has to be bad when you just got a free meal, chicken tenders and fries, and and you know the tables turn even after you get it from me. So this has to be terrible, right? And I'm gonna, I'm about to explain exactly why things went bad. Okay. 
And it started out with me getting home, and then I realized that I didn't get my large red beans and rice. I assumed that when she took my credit card, she at least charged me for that. Mm. So I went back to the I went back to the restaurant. This is a short uh, drive from my home, and this is where the bad part of the story comes in. Uh, I tell the, I go inside. I don't go through the drive through this time. I go inside. I, I explain that I didn't get the red beans and rice or a receipt. So she walks away from the counter, gets that same manager who took my order at the window, and she, she comes up to me, and she's being real nasty towards me at this point. She goes, I didn't give them to you because uh, you didn't pay for anything. I, I asked for my receipt most of all, and she goes, you didn't pay for anything, and she's being really snappy and rude. Mm. And then I said, well, I assume you charged me for the red beans and rice at least. He goes, you want them? You got to pay for them. That just dusted me right there because a total stranger assuming that I was a cheapskate seeking free food. That offended me. Right. So she walked, I said, I'll be glad to pay for them. And she goes, okay. And then she walked, and I said, you didn't get that even though you gave me free food, you still didn't get the red beans and rice. She goes, nope, in a nasty voice. And then I, she walks back to the drive through window and I hear her gossiping with the other employees making fun of me and I hear her going, gosh, and stuff like that and just saying nasty things and making fun of me to no end and mm. this prompted me when I got home I called the corporate office and I gave them a very detailed account of what happened mm. if Tillman Fertitta was there and this was his restaurant I bet you he would have treated her worse than he treated his his employees at a San Antonio restaurant who threw away the silverware in the book he gives a very a very good account of he, of him catching his employees throwing away silverware at one of his locations in San Antonio which caused him to take the trash can and dump it out on the floor. Yeah, so, well, I won't say treat treat them worse. I would say you'd be probably more disgusted with that than, you know, more disgusted. Instead of saying, to just making a better word for it, because treat it, saying, oh yeah, the way they treat them was bad. The way they treat, she treated you was terrible. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, oh boy. I mean, I did not want free food. I was more than willing to pay for what I ordered. But on top of that, the fact that they didn't have the computer ready, I also forgot to mention that when I walked into the restaurant, I saw stacks and stacks of boxes of NCR uh, tape, you know, the, the cash register brand. Mm -hmm. And that told me they didn't even have their cash register computers ready to go. Yeah. Is, this the, is this the one by that fitness connection? Uh, no, that one, this is not the one uh, by Fitness Connection. This is actually the one in Mission Bend, Texas. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, the thing, the thing is, these, these fast food restaurants, they have so many franchises that, you know, a lot of the time, that's why Chick-fil-A is so popular because they're, then I mean, of course, their meal is good and they have really good lemonade, but the hospitality is top notch when it comes to fast food restaurants. You know what I mean? I can definitely attest to that. I was at Chick Fil A uh, actually just days after the incident at Popeyes happened. Mm -hmm. I was with some of my family, and uh, also a good friend of mine that I've known for a long time manages this one particular location. But what I noticed is that we placed our order, we sat down, and just seconds after sitting down, it was brought to us, and. I, in my mind, I'm thinking, you can't get better hospitality than this for a fast food restaurant. Yeah. That's just stellar. And the lines for the drive through they back out all the way into the street. But regardless of that, you're in and out of that drive through line like nothing. Yeah, man, it's crazy. It's crazy how a customer will vouch for your hospitality. With Chick-fil-A, they, their literal brand, and I think it's on accident. I think that they molded their company into a culture for their employees to all always be nice, always be hospitable to their customers. So the customer, us customers have taken account for that. And on social media, you like even see uh, uh, videos, made up videos of people dressed like they work at Chick-fil-A and they'll run down the, you know, they'll run across the highway to bring you your food and be like, sir, you forgot your fries. And you know, uh, uh, it's funny how hospitality can change from you vouching for your company to the customer's vouching for your company because they enjoyed their experience with you guys so much and it, it, it becomes talked about. Just like people talk about bad experiences, people eventually will talk about good experiences. You know what I That's mean? That's true. Yeah. And here I was, I just shared a good experience and a bad experience. For for Popeyes, I was the paddle, but for Chick-fil-A, uh, I guess you could say I was just another happy customer and they were the, 
they were delighted to hear such words if they're listening in right now. Mm-hmm. And I would say, you know, these these franchises that have, you know, that they have some person running the company who, you know, possibly they didn't go to school and or they might even drop out of high school, which is fine. I know that you can become a, a hundred dollar millionaire even if you drop out of high school. Uh, but you know, they have a lot. It's so funny. They have a lot of entitlement a lot of the time. You know what I mean? And, uh, not the workers there, but the culture of the of the employees because the way that the, that the company is ran. These these franchises, unlike Chick Fil A, if we're talking about franchise restaurants, unlike Chick Fil A, these other fr- franchises they don't set the tone for the culture of their employees to be a uh, have a standard of hospitality towards. Right. Their customers, you know what I mean, and customers notice that, and therefore you see all these crazy things happen. Sometimes people get into fights at the at the workplace. You know, you'll see it on Twitter, Instagram. Somebody got into a fight at Popeyes. Somebody got into a fight at McDonald's. Or, and you've seen a lot of fights at McDonald's I and at Popeyes in the, in the last couple of months. You're right, and it's not, I won't blame it on the employees because the employees. Let's be honest, you're working for minimum wage. You just got off your other job, or you just got off of school and then you have some person in your face asking about some chicken or a burger and they're just looking at you in disgust you know and the thing is these franchises they haven't set the tone for their employees because maybe they have low standards for their employees maybe they just don't care maybe they know the food you know the brand is going to carry itself and they don't need to worry about the culture of their you know employees but there's something in the culture basically that these franchises they don't instill in their employees and you could just see the difference between you know Chick-fil-A and these other companies you know I would say Canes is a, is, a, is pretty hospita- uh, hospitable to their customers and you know you can just see the difference right with how you know how how the customers interact with you know how they're allowed to I mean I don't know how Chick-fil-A is but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if certain things happen oh yeah you're gonna get fired on the spot you do something you know you act a certain way I'm pretty sure a manager will go correct you over there like that you know and snap a finger like Thanos correct you get you out of there you know what I mean so I think that uh, I think that smaller companies and any company but particularly smaller companies when I say small I would say making under $100,000 a year in revenue in your company you really need to pay attention to the hospitality you have towards your customer and every business has a customer it doesn't matter if you're in the in the construction business doesn't matter if you're in the metals business doesn't matter if you're in the red everybody has a customer and you have to make sure that you're uh, you stay very you, you stay in you're in the good graces of your customer and they understand that you care about them and one of the best ways to do that also mentioned in the book is you not being able to say no to them you should just completely remove the word no out of your vocabulary Tillman Fertitta cannot stress this enough in his book if whenever a, a customer wants something you have to make sure you're able to deliver. And an example that he constantly uses in the book would be a customer who wants to order eggs right after the breakfast hour is over. Mm-hmm. Maybe they've already transitioned into lunch and they're no longer serving breakfast. Right. Now, the average customer does not understand why they cannot cook breakfast after the breakfast hour is over. And it's mainly because they want to have the grill clean, free of any uh, any breakfast foods. They don't want the, the flavor and any grind from any of the breakfast foods cooked to to wipe off on hamburgers and other stuff that people eat for lunch. So mm-hmm. Tillman Fertitta even says in this book that if they're if they want eggs and breakfast is over, simply go ahead and make them for them, but charge them an extra, charge them extra for it. Charge them, uh, maybe you could charge them a few dollars more for it just to, it's basically a charge for the, what's the word I'm looking for? I won't say inconvenience because every customer is a blessing. Always remember that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say it's just uh, having to go the extra step to do so because they're asking for something out of the ordinary. You normally don't provide such a service at a certain time and you still need to be able to do something to remain hospitable towards them. Right. So you should never be able to say no to any customers. You should never be able to do that. So let's put this all in perspective. 
So let's say, let's say a customer at our company, an unreasonable customer, they come and we do a website for them. Let's say we do a beautiful website for them. And now they're saying they want to put a search engine in it, but they don't, they want it for a cheaper price than we give it to them for. How would you resolve that? Just so we can put this in perspective. Well, to start off, they signed a contract saying that uh, the search engine services may or may not be included depending on what they, which uh, deal they chose. Right, well, let's say it's not included. Well, if it's not included, I have to bill them at the appropriate rate. Now, if they if they say that it's too much, then I simply go in detail over what this job entails and try to make them understand why it costs so much to provide such a service. Mm -hmm. It's completely on to the customer if they want to take it or leave it. They can say yes, they can say no. I can't make them say yes. Now, what if they become irritated with the price, in your opinion? Well, if they're irritated, irritable, you know what I mean? If they do not like the pricing, then I simply respectfully tell them that uh, we're sorry, we, we can't exactly lower the price due to how much it costs to do this job. We're not saying no because uh, we're not saying no because we we don't want to do it at a cheaper rate. We're saying no because there's a lot of work involved and we charge this price for a reason. Mm -hmm. See now, I want that's the that's the thing that we should circle on. You know, you don't have to say no. You always can stay respectful and let mm -hmm. them understand why it is that it has to be, that that price has to be that price. Right. But there's other things that you don't have to say no and, and or respect respectfully uh, decline what it is that the that the customer is is offering. No. There's a lot of times where you can come up with an alternative, and there's times where a customer is being on reasonable and it has to be a no but you can respectfully say no I'm sorry sir this is not how uh, this is not what we can do and this is the reason why but uh, you know just be as respectful as possible right um, don't get out of your element you know what I mean correct and mm -hmm. say being able to to say yes to your customer and being hospitable go hand in hand and you just put it you just said it perfectly right there you you should always be able to be as nice as you can to them no matter how how unreasonable they may be, no matter how rude they are, you have to be able to treat them like kings and queens. Yeah. They are the lifeblood of your business. Without them, you're not making any money. Hey, I, honestly, I don't think it's hard, CG, you know, because all you have to do is put yourself in their shoes. How would you want, like, how would you want somebody to speak to you, especially if you know you're about to give them your money? How would you want somebody to treat you? It's not hard to, to understand that you need to be uh, be respectful. You need to be uh, nice to your customer. That's right. like, honestly, I think that that's a, that's like a first instinct. It is. So, and if you honestly, if you don't understand that, you need to re to change your behavior. And I think all around, because that just makes that that doesn't make you a bad person. But you just want to be a better person and being nice to people. But if you think you want to run a business and a successful business, trust me, you're gonna need customers, and you're right. not going and you're not just gonna need customers. You're going to need those customers that keep coming back to you. Right. It's called a reoccurring customer. And you want them to keep coming back to you because if a customer comes to you one time, they never come back to you again. How many people do you think are disposable like that? Not many. And even in the book, he says that it, uh, if you lose a customer, then that, that can be very dangerous for your business because you can't, you're not costs a, It costs a lot of money. It don't look like it does off the, off the jump, but that costs a lot it of money does. to lose a customer you know uh, think about it like this if McDonald's customers right now if every customer that went there today never come back if this was all their last time you know how many hundreds of million dollars McDonald's will lose just because all the customers that they get today they came and they all were dissatisfied and they never come back again right McDonald's is going under the water I promise you it will be a <laughs> it will be World War 3 in the, in the fast food industry you know what I mean so right. you have to understand that every customer no customer there are no spare customers no customer is disposable you want every customer when they first come to when they last come you want them to always have a good taste in mind because it just opens their mind to always coming uh, back and uh, it's 12 17 right now so I have to go some so before we get out of here CG uh, I want to talk about uh, do you have any pop culture hot takes I mean, uh, what what time 
would you say by example? When I say pop culture, I would just say anything that you see when you when you walk out when you walk out of this room mm-hmm. and whatever you see, you know, whether it's on TV, whether it's in people, just what pop culture hot takes do you have that directly affiliated with business? Anything that you know, you know, Disney Plus just came out, you know, just anything in pop culture, and you know, people just it's just popular. Sometimes right. you know, pop culture is just popular. Well, I'm glad you brought up Disney Plus because that that is definitely taking off right now, and it it certainly shows that a business is keeping up with the times during this port cutting season. I should say mm-hmm. a lot of people are cutting cable for these subscription services, and Tillman Fertitta says in his book, you need to be able to adapt to those times, or you'll go under yourself. It can be that could be another one of those paddles. Right. And Disney knew this, which is why, in fact, Disney even prepared ahead of time first by buying out 21st Century Fox earlier this year. Mm -hmm. They bought it mainly for the content libraries they could stream across Disney Plus in addition to their own library of pictures and and TV shows that they have. So in terms of business, uh, just remember, you have to be able to stay. You have to be able to adapt to the times or else you're going to go under. Always keep keep your, your customers in mind, especially your target audience. And always make sure that do whatever it takes to make them happy, but also make sure that uh, you're you're giving them the services that they need. Not just the services that they think they need, but try to offer them the ones that you know that they need and they'll be very happy with you. That doesn't doesn't mean trying to go out there trying to hard sell stuff. That means tell them this is the service that you need and then this is how much it's gonna cost. And then show them why they need it. Don't just tell them, show them an example of how it could benefit themselves. And let me tell you guys something. important thing as well if there's no there's nothing like somebody telling you something and it's just you you giving them knowledge and giving it to them for free you know don't don't underestimate the value of giving somebody a service yeah and putting a price on it but also including something in there for free you know people will take that into account you know when you tell them you know you need you need this this and this and I'm gonna I'm gonna just put it in there for free for you I'm gonna, I'm gonna include that in the fee that you're paying. don't undervalue that I know sometimes people think that oh if I give them this for free then we lost then we're losing money right there's arbitrage and and there's arbitrage in in free services and knowing that knowing that the person you're working with that they care about if you you know they care about the service that they're giving they care about how well you take their service and you know and uh and their product you know they take into account how much how giving you are you know what I I mean, that doesn't mean give something for free all the time, but don't undervalue it. Right. Yeah. You can make a lot of customers happy like that. 100%. They're, going, they're not going to forget you. So I have a pop culture hot take. Yes. My pop culture hot take is rappers, mm-hmm. artists, singers, R&B singers. When you guys are selling merch, stop. Stop putting your name on merch or your face on merch and expecting people to just to to have a sell out of your merch. Yes, it ha- yes, I understand why people do it and I think that it's a good tactic. I'm, I just don't think that should be your only tactic. Let me not say stop doing that. You shouldn't stop doing that cuz when whoever buys that you is you're getting data. You you're learning who your core base is, who your hard followers, your hardcore followers are. But at the same time, if you really want to make some money, come up with a good idea. When you coming up with these merchants, uh the I mean this this this, this merchandise whether you want to sell hoodies, whether you want to sell socks, hats, shirts, anything, come up with a good niche, uh, uh, something that you can make a logo out of, a brand out catchy of, slogan. a catchy slogan, something and, and, and a nice artwork, and then put that for sale. I promise you, those will sell more than than you know than something with your name on it and how uh, you know and something that has to do with your face you know that may work it could, it, it, for you to identify your core fan base but you need to understand that if you come up with 
with a nice niche and people already like you you all you already have the influence on somebody so they look at it and they can make the decision whether they think that that's that they like that or they don't like that I'm telling you right now I and I never will buy anything with another man's face on it or another man's uh, um, name on it other than a jersey a sports jersey and I know women who are who adore Rihanna but you know let me not say Rihanna Rihanna probably can't get somebody to buy something with her face on the one that's Rihanna Rihanna has a couple of those but it, 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 there's women that love certain like Megan Thee Stallion talented she's doing really well uh, uh, I think she's gonna become even a bigger star than she already is now but there's very few people who will buy something that just says Megan Thee Stallion on it I don't know if you've heard of Megan Thee Stallion she's a rapper in Houston that came mm-hmm. out of Houston but nobody's gonna buy it. she's very big I'm talking about on Instagram she has at least 5 million followers on Instagram or more nobody's gonna buy something that only says Megan Thee Stallion it that doesn't make, make it doesn't make sense you know maybe I won't say nobody she has a core fan base that may do that right. but she has a bigger chance and, and any other artist has a bigger chance of getting more sales on their merchandise if they come up with a niche that doesn't have it might have to do with it may have something to do with your brand mm-hmm. but it doesn't at least it doesn't have your name or your face on it you know what I mean, I don't know too many people that will buy things with people's faces on it and their names on it other than a sports jersey. Right. So that's my hot take for pop culture. Um, do you have anything you want the people to look out for this week or in the next coming, in, in the future? I, I would just say uh, in general, keep those of you who are business owners, just keep pushing forward. Just keep, uh, just keep going, no matter how bad things may be or no matter how great things are. Uh, I wanted to conclude by saying that in the book he talks about how most businesses go under because many of them lose hope when they start struggling and many businesses do struggle their first couple of years in business because they're still learning Mm -hmm. so I would just say as we move into 2020 make your new year's resolution to be the best business owner that you can be Mm -hmm. don't don't let anybody or anyone discourage you from from being successful you can be successful no matter what happens I, I encourage everybody to read this book and and check it out even if you're not a business owner it still has a lot of motivational tips in there that everybody could apply towards real life shut up and listen that's what it's called shut up and listen it doesn't get any more straightforward than that it doesn't uh before we get out of here cg uh i wanted to say be on the lookout for be on the lookout for disney I know we we talked about Disney Plus uh, very seldom, but uh, look out on look out for Disney Plus. Even though that they look at their stock their stock price, uh, even though they went up, they 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 really went up uh, a big amount. Um, they're not gonna stop going up. So anybody who invests. Uh, and has you know some okay money to invest don't forget about Disney uh, um, watch out for what Netflix is doing Netflix I know that the Disney made their move and they they, they released their um, their app Netflix immediately uh, Netflix immediately acquired rights to you know publish new Nickelodeon content and old content on their thing and you guys have to watch out when you're ready to invest in a company because you have to really when you want to invest in a company you need to understand their you need to understand how many streams of income they're getting you understand the lucrative the the liquid cash that they may have you need to understand what dividends are Um, let me just validate myself real quick Um, uh, when I was in college I I invested in Netflix when it was at $90 a share and that's only because I stepped back well somebody told me what the stock market was and how to look at the stock market how to understand what a good investment is so when I looked at Netflix I saw how much income they were getting and how many different streams of income when I looked at Netflix I considered that one they make their own they make their own content two they allow people to 
make content and they send it to Netflix. You know what I mean? And they make movies and they send it to Netflix and for Netflix right. to publish their movies. And third, I look the subscription. Subscription fees are so important, man. If you see a company is getting, uh, they have a lot of customers. How much you, if they if a, if a company has over a million customers and they're charging ten dollars a month to be a customer, you can you know do the math. You know, with Netflix, I think that they got over 10 million customers and I think that the price was like uh, at first I think it was like nine ninety nine at first and I think right now they're probably at like sixteen ninety nine. Yeah, something. it's gone up. Yeah, yeah, which is scary. I don't know about that, but what I'm saying is, I at that time this is like around 2015. I saw that that they had a lot of subscription and all the streams of income, so I knew to uh, to invest in them. They went up to two hundred and eighty, and I was like, man, I was jumping for joy just because <laughs> it feels good to get your investment right. But that money, man, that money was. Right. So, uh, on July, I saw, in July of 2018, I saw Disney was acquiring Fox, and they were going to battle with Comcast to bid for Fox. Right. I think it was Fox, right? Yeah, 21st Century Fox. Yeah. And it's also important to know that the only assets they were buying were mainly their movie studios and mm-hmm. several cable networks. Rupert Murdoch, the current owner of New Fox, was holding on to the Fox Network and Fox News Channel and a few other smaller assets. Yeah, so I saw that Disney was stocking their inventory and I took into consideration oh they own Marvel oh they they're bringing back all the old mm-hmm. Disney stuff they and when you Star think Wars. of right Star Wars when you think of Disney you think of kids right and kids you have to you guys have to understand that kids influence their parents to buy stuff more than their their parents influence kids to buy so kids will influence a parent to buy anything I know that you know when you were a kid you were probably used to getting taught Oh, no by your parents I know I was Every time I passed At McDonald's I was like Can I get it No <laughs> No I, I, mom, Mama gonna make A better burger Than McDonald's do <laughs> So But no the, Honestly Kids influence Their parents to buy You know Buy them things More than the parent Influence That's kids true. To buy stuff And uh, Disney is one of the things That I know that A kid will vouch for And I know parents Even nostalgic reasons Will want to get Disney So I knew that In July I invested a little bit in there as well, and it went up. So I went. I just want to let the listeners know that uh, Disney's still a good buy, and to pay attention to it. Yeah, let me close. I gotta go. Well, thank you for all of your personal insights on all of this today, Elder. Uh, we're, thank we're you, glad CG. Thank you for that pop pop story. <laughs> glad to share it with you. <laughs> Thank you for tuning into our podcast. We encourage you to please leave some feedback. Contact us at info, I-N-F-O at creativitydesigngroup.com and please share any comments, questions, or thoughts. I personally answer all the emails and I will be more than happy to answer anything that you want to share with us. And also follow us on Instagram at creativitydesigngroup. Uh, I'm not going to spell all that. That's a long long little phrase, but creativity design group on Instagram on LinkedIn as well um, and we'll be giving you as much information as possible man we're for the entrepreneurs we're for the business owners and we want to see people excel we'll be more than happy to help you get started if you're starting a business and you need branding materials clothing social media marketing website design that's what our company is for and we will be glad to help you at the, at some of the most competitive prices in the Houston area right. those of you who are listening here in Houston again thank you for listening we wish you all the best day and bye for now please tune in next week for our next episode have a great week